Hi, this is Anna Imagination, and I am from the Healing Garden, coming to you with subconscious dialogues. I'm doing a lot of contemplating lately and redesigning, refiguring. Every time you experience a perspective shift, you have to step back and just, whoa, everything's different. You know, and that's really what I'm doing here. I have been pursuing perspective most of my life. It's my obsession, obsession, the pursuit of perspective. I remember when I was 18, I read this book. I didn't read the book. I read the first paragraph of the book called, I can't remember the name of the book even. And it was a physics book about wormholes and they were depicting these fish underneath this pond. And the author took great care to explain how we view the perspective of the top of the pool with the fish moving down underneath it like a smooth slate of glass. But for the fish looking up and seeing our bulbous bodies and then raindrops like slamming down into it, the whole thing was just this massive, beautiful perspective shift. And I, I read nothing else after that. I was just completely enamored by the concept of perspective. I was that child that every time they brought home a magic eye, I was, I was a child when magic eye first came out. And there was this massive craze for two years. Do you see it? Do you see it? I remember reading newspaper comic strips, Blondie, and they were making jokes about, do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? That was the trend and the craze of magic eyes. And I was the kind of person I had to see. I had to see. I had to see every one of them. I spent a week just staring and staring. It was, I had to see the other perspective. I had to know what everyone else saw. I could never be a perspective behind anyone. That's really my whole life. I have never been okay with being at a disadvantage to see a perspective. And maybe that's my trauma. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe I figured out at some point that, oh, if I get real smart and I shift my perspective, I'll be one step ahead of them. So maybe this is my trauma. He one could almost say that it completely disrupts my way of life because it literally has consumed every aspect. I have lost jobs because of this pursuit because I can't stop working on my theories to focus on a day job. Because I'm just like, I have to understand perspective. So every time I had a perspective shift, and maybe that's my drug of choice is the other thing is there's a chemical that happens in the brain when you perspective shift and I can feel it. And I don't think it's a an addiction because I'm not thinking about the chemical or the euphoric. I'm not pursuing. I just want clarity. I just want to understand. I have to understand. And I could feel like every time I got to a larger, greater door, I could feel the knob shaking, like, oh, there's, there's, and I, I was just like, where's my lock picks? And I would spend hours just picking the lock, intricately pulling apart subconscious mind and words, vernacular feelings, emotions, energy, and how they all just interact with each other. And it was just this massive, I felt like for 30 years, I was untangling the world's largest ball of thread, where half of the threads are invisible. This is my life work. And I got to level eight and I shifted again. And I felt the usual disorientation. I really need to write this down because this is it. You get disorientation and then you get, let me, let me actually track this. I've never actually sat down and tracked it. And this is where it gets interesting because I just shifted from seven to eight. And when I felt this, not just, but like a few days ago. So there's disorientation. And there's disorientation. And then there is this stage where you start small at just what's around you. And then you expand out like this. Because you have to rethink everything in your life now with this new perspective. And it always starts with your most immediate to the last thing. And it's going to be this massive, I'm going to call it the age of exploration, where you have to relearn everything all over again because you had it's like no no i'll tell you what it is it's when you read harry potter the first time and you go <gasps> and then you read book two and you go <gasps> and then you go back to book one and you go <gasps> 
And then you go back to book two and you go, "Uh uh-huh. And then you go to book three and go, (gasps) and then you go back to book one and you go, (gasps) and then you go back to book two and go, (gasps) and then you go back to book three and go, "Uh uh-huh. And then you go, you get the idea. It's like that. It's exactly like that. That is what you are doing. That is perspective shift. You want a perspective shift? Read the Harry Potter books. You'll get one every time you put the book down. And it does. It shifts your perspective and suddenly you can see it because you can understand each other. You can relate to each other. And the most interesting thing about all of this is when the the most important thing is you can relate to yourself. That's the other thing with perspective shifts. There's you relating to you, but then there's like, I'm sorry, there's you relating to one person. You relating to, oh, I can understand, you know, I get your perspective, I understand your point of view. And it's, it's frustration. That's why everyone's angry. They're just frustrated because they can't communicate. And they can't communicate because they're not seeing each other's perspective. So when I started off with this whole thing, I was like, oh, just shift perspectives and you can get around your mental illness. And that's how I got out. I had to kept, I literally shifted my perspective to see as an outsider. And then I saw as an outsider. And then I saw as an outsider. And as I kept trying to stand as an outsider to look in so I could see what, because what, what you're doing, because when you go to a professional, they say, well, sometimes you just need a different perspective. You need somebody from the outside to comment. That's what I was going for, but I didn't have anybody. I just had me. So I had this thing where I learned how to shift my first person point of view to a third person point of view. That's how all of this started is I learned how to shift perspectives. And I remember when I wrote my fantasy novel, I remember like I I felt like I was the cameraman and I had this massive camera helicopter view and then I zoom in and, you know, as the camera moves and shifts, you get closer and closer and you're shifting perspectives the whole time. And I could feel me doing that. I can feel myself pull out to this third person omniscient presence and then I could feel myself push in and then look and see everything dissected close. The problem is when we're living day to day, we only see up close dissection. So it's like, remember when we were kids and they had these magazines where you had to just stare at these images blown up and you're like, what is that? And you find out you've been contemplating a toothbrush for 20 minutes. It's that, it's that exactly. That is it exactly. But no one talks about perspective. The work looks like it started in 1970 and then it just spiral dynamics with Dr. Grace introduced it and then nothing. There's been nothing since. And my little obsession in 1995, I only heard about Dr. Graves two days, three days ago now, Friday, last Friday is when I first heard of him. So I'm just looking at all of this going, oh, I'm just continuing perspective research. And it's in perspective that we're trapped. It's in our minds, that's the prison. It's in our perspective, that's the prison. And every, I'll tell you, the first through four perspectives, they were, they were hell. And it's amazing. When I got to eight, I could suddenly see myself at every perspective. And I understood all of me suddenly. And I was able to accept all of me on a level I never even contemplated before. Here we're talking about, you got to love all of yourself. And I remember it's two-dimensional thinking versus fifth-dimensional thinking. At two-dimensional thinking, that not the same as level two, but two-dimensional thinking, you're thinking things like, like, like my body, my self-image. What do, you, what do you mean I have to love myself, all the parts of me? What parts? What are you talking about, my parts? Like, that doesn't make sense. And I was there. I remember thinking that doesn't make any sense. What does it mean, love all the parts of me, all the perspective parts of you? It's like someone started writing them down and never finished the sentence. So we only got parts of these sentences that got passed down generation to generation. Honestly, it was probably someone say, the key to life is to to keep an open perspective and love all of those parts of your perspective. And then he passed. And they carried on that message down, down until all that was left was you have to love all the parts. And now we're going, well, that doesn't make any sense because the phone game got distorted. Oral tradition really messed this one up. Oral tradition really messed this up. By the time we had the ability to write all this down, we didn't have pens and pencils. We didn't have books. We couldn't write. 
So we had oral tradition. And by the time we had access to write this stuff down, what, only 200 years ago, we had forgotten most of it. So we had no way to sit there and be like, you got the message wrong. So here we are stumbling around psychology with nothing but bits and pieces of broken oral tradition that don't even make sense anymore because the phone game has completely messed them up. And now Dr. Freud comes along and he's trying to piecemeal stuff back together again. So yeah, it's all starting to make sense now. Once you realize that it's just everything revolves around these perspective shifts. And it's, it's just been extraordinary. So I'm in this shift and there's always a depression. There's always a grief after because the grief is you're counting all your losses and you realize all of your losses and you have to focus on all your gains. The problem is the gains are unknown because you just got here. I don't know what's waiting for me in level eight. Yes, I do. I know exactly what's waiting for me. I can see all, I can see so far. I know what's waiting for me in level eight. That was a bad example. When I got to level five, I had no idea what was waiting for me. I had a hope and a dream and a guitar. No, I didn't have a guitar. I didn't even have a guitar. I had a hope and a dream. That's what I had at level five. I had nothing. When I got to level six, I had a vision. That's, that's where I was when I got to level six and a calling and an obsession. I, I had a vision, a calling, an obsession. That's where I was at level six. There was something that welcomed you at every door. At four, you get your job, you get your wife, you get your car, you get everything ideal and perfect like the American dream. That's what you're, you walk into four and you're right, here I am, I'm at perspective four. I just got out of my teenage years, it was hell. I'm now in perspective four, let's do this. I'm gonna get my perfect dream, the American dream, the 2.5 children. That's perspective five. They're very hopeful. Perspective five, five you walk in and you just go, I've got to open a dream. I've got a hope and a dream, and that's all. That's all you've got in five. You know you don't like that, and you know you want to hope and a you, you realize you've been duped by the American dream. That's what it is. Fives are going, oh, oh, that's bullshit. That's not, a, that's not, that's not. I know, they like Disney's fault. Like all the fives and all the sixes are pointing a finger at number fours going, you're Disney's problem. Disney made you. That's what fours and our fives and sixes are doing. It's really funny because I can just see this whole thing makes sense now. It's just extraordinary to see everything just click into place with this perspective. And I'm still exploring it. Like I went to my daughter at two doctor appointments today. I went to the first one and I was there for like two seconds. And the doctor came in and I went, okay, so she's a five and this is definitely a four society. And I could see where she had to conform to what the fours wanted. So she stopped and she's like typing up all this information and she's getting a full history. And I'm a six, I, I'm like in six, seven, eight mind thinking, do you really need this information? Why are you collecting all of my data? Is that really important to my daughter's health? I know exactly what you're trying to ask that for. And that has nothing whatsoever to do with here. That's data collecting from the government. So it was really, it wasn't funny. It was, it was hilarious, but it wasn't funny. It was funny. <laughs> so it, it, it was, it was extraordinary to see it unfold. And I could tell, and it was funny because she, she, she brought up Buddhism and she and I started talking about Buddhism and I could definitely see where ethically she was definitely a solid six, but doctors are very groomed to be fives. Doctors, you have to be like, it's the discipline. I get it. Um, so they are groomed to be fives. But this particular doctor, I could see she was a six. Attorneys are the same way. They're groomed to be fives. They are groomed, which I think is why doctors and, and attorneys, when they get into their career, 99% of them, there is no other option. You don't spend X amount of dollars. Oh, they're caught up in the sunk cost fallacy. That's what it is. And had either one of them studied economics, they would have known this. But because they went to be a doctor and attorney, most likely they did not study economics. I see that. So they are not aware of sunken cost fallacy. Sunken cost, sunk cost fallacy is from economics and investment. It's the understanding that when you put money into something with the idea of getting something back or being invested in, like a relationship, it's, it's basically when people use time as currency. 
So you give somebody 20 years of your life and then the marriage falls apart and you're going, but we wasted 20 years. No, you gave 20 years. You got 20 years. It was an even exchange. But people don't think like that. People use time as currency. I gave 20 years. Yeah, but you also received 20 years from your partner. It's, it's interesting. Giving and receiving. I'm doing a lot of research right now on giving and receiving. I haven't talked at all about it yet because I'm, I'm still like playing around with it. Giving and receiving. You know... It's the, it's one of the hardest things and sharing is part of this giving, receiving and sharing hardest, hardest things to learn is giving, sharing. What's the other one? Giving, sharing and receiving. These are three emotions. I just started exploring them, just started really diving into what these three emotions are. And it's funny that they're last. They're last because they're first. I have been studying the emotions backwards so that my most prominent aggressive emotion was, oh, this is hard. What was the first emotion? It would be fear. Fear was the first emotion. But that's not the first one we're taught, not as children. People think we come into this world and fear is the first emotion. And no, it's not. We come into this world happy. I have given birth to three children. I have been in the room with my sister after she's given birth to three of her children. Babies are born happy. Babies are born very happy. Nothing wrong with them. Just a beautiful, clean slate of happy. That's natural. Something has to happen to make the child switch from happy to upset. A catalyst has to occur our natural state is happy. It really is. So I worked my way backward from fear all the way back. And I finally am down to gratitude, sharing, I'm sorry, giving, giving, sharing, and receiving. And they are hard emotions. Now giving I, I like giving. I love giving. My problem is I know I'm in the danger of giving more than I should because I give without getting energy back. And that's not okay. Everything costs energy. Money is energy. Sex is energy. Time is energy. Oh, that makes so much more sense now. <sighs> These are energies that all three can be exchanged for services. All three have a very beautiful balance. All three require an equal exchange, even Stephen, or the karma police will come. The karma police come because the energy calls, because the energy must be aligned, because the energy doesn't know how to do anything else in the world. Why do you think you have pain when you're misaligned? It's because the energy doesn't like misalignment. It doesn't like anything being misaligned. The energy pool, sometimes I wonder if I created her. Sometimes I really do wonder because I have the memories sometimes. And I just look at her and I'm going, she has to be aligned. Everything has to be in perfect harmony. And that's all she's trying to do is get to perfect harmony. And she knows where all the pieces go. She knows where every piece goes. So she shifts us all around all the time to get us to go where she needs us to go. Now, some of us are listening and some of us are not. <laughs> and when you start listening, the energy pool just goes, okay, now you get over there, you get over here, I need you to go over there. No, you are two pawns down. I need you to move down here over here. Please thank you. Okay, everyone's set. I see the energy pool doing this. And if you are in her way, she sends you Mercury retrograde. That's right. Mercury retrograde is her way of saying, where is everybody? And she just pushes that through. And if you are not aligned with the energy pool, she's going to let you know it. Because that's how she works. She's the energy pool. 
So that's all she's doing is trying to get everyone back in alignment, which is why she gives you manifestation when you reach a certain stage because she realizes you are helping me and because you're actually helping me and you figured it out and you get it, I'm going to give you this power. And you get the power and you go, I will not abuse my power. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> that, and that is it. That is it. I have a mythology. I'm going to call it my mythology. And I really just need to do a whole podcast focusing on just my mythology. Because I have my mythology. And maybe that's what I'll do here. So I have my mythology. And I love, love going over it. It's beautiful. I see so much with it that direction. And then I have my visions. I very much have my my manifestation side. I have my visions side. I have my spiritual side. And I have my philosophy side. And then I have my psychology side. And I'm and I have my research side, the side where I just want to kind of sit back with a cup of tea, cup of tea, and be like, oh, and it's Earl Grey hot, just so you know. And I just want to sit back and be like, I had a really long day today, guys. I had a really long day. So I created like five podcasts. Well, two podcasts. I have two podcasts, subconscious dialogues. Thank you. And shifting perspectives. Shifting perspectives is my baby. That one will be on. I have 20 year plans for shifting perspectives. But I have psych soup and I love psych soup because I feel like I can just grab that coffee, sit back and just chill. And I don't have to worry about, am I saying things wrong? Am I saying things right? I can just hypothesize. And that's, that's really it is when I go into that space, it's like, I'm going to hypothesize and I don't have to worry about, is this a fact? Is this a fiction? Is this just a theory that I have? Is this even going to check out in a week? And it's my safe space to ramble without having to worry about fact. And it's so a place where I can say, don't take anything I say here. Take it for a grain of salt. This is my grain of salt page. I, that would be an awesome podcast title, grain of salt. I'm sure that one's done. That one's obvious. I am certain that one's taken. Now I got to Google this grain of salt podcast. I'm going to do it because I want to know. Is that grain of salt podcast? Because that is just catchy. Yep. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some marketing genius scooped that up. You don't think that shit up and then let that go aside. You go, oh, that's good. I'm going to grab it. Somebody already grabbed it. Grain of Salt podcast. Epic. Jealous. Now, actually, the right word in that case is envious. That is the feeling of envy. Every time you drop the word, I am so jealous. That's actually envy. Jealous is what you feel when your partner is off with somebody else, that's jealousy. That's possession. That's something else. But it's not envy. And actually, maybe that is envy. And jealousy is the mild one. I've always been stuck on the phrase from the Bible, I am a jealous God. I cannot tell you how much that grates on all of my logic, the argument goes something like this. But you're supposed to be perfect. Since when are God's perfect claiming that they're jealous? That's a very human emotion for you to have, jealousy, and your pure love. What does jealousy have to do with love? Jealousy is the opposite of love. Jealousy involves fear, neglect. Something's not making sense here. A God of pure love, and I know that God, a God of pure love would have no room for fear, are you implying that you have emotions? What is a God doing with emotional response? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that very interesting? God punishes. God has rage and God is jealous. Interesting. But God is love. I don't know about you, but those sound like pretty human emotions to me. I always thought that was very suspicious. What is a God doing with human emotions? God, I remember being like four years old, reading that in the Bible and just going, well, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I got into trouble a lot because I questioned a lot of the Bible. 
And that was one of them. That one really just, how can God be love and God be jealous? That's going to bug me all night too. I still haven't figured that one out. I'm working on it. But in the new, in the um, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet, covet desire. Thy neighbor's wife. I like how he clarifies your neighbor's wife. Everybody else's wife is okay, but not your neighbor's. And I'm curious about that. If that was on purpose, if that was code for something, <laughs> did we mistranslate the word neighbor at some point? Did it mean something different than we know out of it today? I'm very interested about their wording. Did, was this written by somebody who specifically was speaking about the time that he did covet after his neighbor's wife and he was just projecting through the Ten Commandments? Was that going on? I think about shit like this. So I have these podcasts with all of my ideas. And I know that when I sit down and talk shifting perspectives, there's going to be a lot of people, four and under, who have no interest in it. And that's okay. I don't want them over there because it, it, I just, it's, it's not for them. What they need is this. What they need what they need would be the witch's corner. And that's actually what I'm talking about is I'm now looking at my podcasts, playlists, and I'm going, I think I'm done with witch's corner. I think I am. And it's funny because I could feel how I was a level five, level six, and I started it. And I had this phenomenal little space, but I think I'm going to switch over to more of a light workers union podcast where I talk about light work because that would attract more sixes and sevens and not the twos or the fours. So I feel better. I definitely feel wiser about making that choice. And I understand a lot of my problems also. I remember I was, I was, mis I had a lot of twos in my life, people who were on tribal perspective. And I did not realize how many twos I had in my life. And because they speak ethereal, I thought I was talking to a six, a lot of cases. Turns out I was talking to twos. Twos idolize sixes. Sixes and twos can talk to each other. Sixes and twos can talk to each other, which means sevens and threes might be able to talk to each other. Eights can talk to fours. But seven and twos, yeah. No, twos are, are, I'm sorry, six and two. Did I get the numbers right? Six, two, seven, three. Yes, I did. Okay. So yeah, it's, I, I didn't realize that the thing I idolized, so to speak, was so similar to what they, I saw commonality there. I saw commonality between the perspectives. Listen to how I'm speaking. Since I've been on perspective eight, my entire speech is different I have literally had to invent a new vocabulary just to communicate what I have found. And I'll, I'll be talking to people now and texting them. And I'll be talking to my daughter now. And it's, I mean, it's instantaneous. Within two to three days, my entire household now, my two of my children are using the language. Oh, they're a six, two, four trying to commute. Oh, I get it. They're, they're, they're a four. Oh, the four is not understanding the six and the six is being condescending because the four is recognizing that there's a perspective gap. That's where condescending comes from. Oh, and I've watched my children interact. My children have had one fight, one, since they've been here. They used to be like tearing each other's throats out. And I watched them resolve every conflict on their own since then. And this is how the conversations go. It's, you're not understanding my perspective. I understand that that's your perspective, but I feel like you're not listening to mine. And then it's, oh, that's my perspective. I can see where I'm pushing my perspective onto yours. Or Lizzie, 
You cannot force your perspective on your brother. He is a different person. He's going to think and feel different than you. And it's suddenly this space of, oh, let me give you space because you're a two. Let me give you space because I'm, I'm a three or threes don't talk like this at all, at least not to my hypothesis. I have to test it. I have yet to subject myself to a three to try this out. So there's a lot of space and there's a lot of patience, understanding now, kindness. I even dropped it the other day in a joke. And I immediately, my daughter and I both went, no, no. I said, I am sorry. That is in, uh, that is going to be one of my rules, one of my codes, not allowed. No, not funny. It was extraordinary how instantly that just grated against the energy. So any kind of condensation, condescending, any kind of stabs at the negativity. We see it with astrology. It cannot be allowed with these perspectives. Holy shit, it cannot be allowed with these perspectives. It's vital that it's not. It just isn't present. It can't be. It's that, oh, well, she's a Virgo or, oh, you know, Pisces. And there's a lot of ugly hate going around with tarot readings and spiritual groups where they'll take time out to hate on the other Zodiac. It's a horrible thing. It's really not a nice thing to do. It's offensive. It creates significantly negative energy that contaminates the energy pool. And it's a form of, well, racism. It's prejudice. It's literally cultured prejudice. And I unfollow people who do that. I see it. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you cultivating prejudice? They're doing it. So there cannot be cultivated prejudice between the perspectives. That's the problem. Stop cultivating prejudice and generalization. A subconscious mind is what's stuck, not. It's one of the things I see a lot of is anytime someone mistakes a trauma trigger for a Zodiac personality. Oh, it, it, it grates me so bad. I, I cannot. Every time I see it, I'm like, okay, you seriously lack some education here in trauma versus astrological traits. Like I've studied both heavily and no, a trauma trait, like being angry all the time, that's a trauma trait. Well, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of threes. And if you're attracted to a certain type of Zodiac, I am, then you're going to keep attracting the same kind of people. And if you have mental illness B, you're going to pull in mental illness A. So you are actually misaligned to your prejudice because you are trauma by association. You are associating the anger and the rage with something that has no characteristics at all. For example, that you have just Aries. The Aries has nothing to do with it unless you're a Taurus and an Aries and an argument. And I'm speaking from like, yeah. Taurus and an Aries in an argument. But the, the prejudice, is, it's disgusting. And that's, that's a huge problem. And it cannot be carried over. It cannot be carried over. And it just, I'm learning. I'm going through and I'm literally like pulling this apart and I'm learning it as I go. And I'm definitely saying where, okay, this can't be okay because I can feel it shifting the energy. And this over here can be okay. So I'm trying to figure out which parts, and I can feel it, which is corner was very much my, my fifth and sixth level personality, especially my sixth level personality. I felt that. That was my sixth level perspective. I felt it. And then I climbed up to seven. And that's, that's when I did a lot of subconscious dialogues. And then I got into, and then I started going back into shifting perspectives. And now I'm going, okay, Anna Tox is gone. Anna Tox was my first. That was when I was level five. So Anna Tox is level five. Witch's Corner is level six. Yeah, I'm going to do this. So you can actually see my, my perspectives. Like as I evolved, you can see where each one of my perspectives shifted into the next. 
and my insights changed, my growth changed, and I got to see. So you can literally see the perspective shifts happening and how I max out one shift and get to the next. So yeah, I have to rerun through everything and it's been overwhelming. It's been a crazy day. I'm now contemplating on, I don't know, I see all the balls I'm juggling. I see everything I'm holding in the air and it's, it's extraordinary. It's absolutely beautiful. And, I, and I'm just so excited and a lot of it's coming together and I have a little bit more tweaks and I feel like I'm about to flip on that switch to my carnival. And I'm almost there. And I'm, I just, it's like you get the Ferris wheel up and then you step back and you're sweating and you're like, okay, now I'm going to go work on the pirate ship. And you get the pirate ship built up. My favorite ride, by the way. I get the pirate ship built up and I get that all set going. And then I step back and I go look over at the carousel and I get all of them worked up and everything's aligned. And then I decorate with lights all over the place and I make sure all the bolts are working. And then you realize, oh, this is catering to the wrong age group. We want to move this over here to make sure. So all the marketing is now in place. And I'm going, okay, now I learned this massive, I have this combination theory now. So I can see people who are coming in and I'm going, oh, I can see where I need to tweak ABC to get the right people. It's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary to watch. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely at a point where I don't know what to do with my sad days. I get days where I'm like, I'm low functioning and I'm tired and I'm like, okay. And I can feel myself tired and drained. And I'm going, do I not show my face? Do I try and keep up this fake image of always happy, always perky, always bubbly? And I can't do that because I'm so tired right now. And everything is going to be okay. What it really feels like is I'm polishing my ship and it's about to set sail. And I am so ready for it to just set sail. And that's that's where I am. I finally have my rhythm. I finally have it down. I'm definitely in love with the podcasts. And I have my, I have my Facebook page growing. I'm definitely bringing the right amount of people in there. I can feel it all just shifting. And like I said, I'm tuned into the universe and I'm just shifting and moving with her. And she's just rotating knobs and it's just all coming together. And I, I, I want to call it dancing with the universe because that's really what it is. You learn how to dance with the universe when you get to this level, when you can feel all the push of your identity, the pull of your intuition. And then she shifts you and you're just, it's like identities behind me with her hands on my hips and intuition is in front of me leading. And it's really identity and intuition using me, the self, to dance with each other. But you have to be consciously aware. Your subconscious mind has to be disciplined. And your fear system has to be turned all the way off. And you have to love the fuck out of yourself. You got to love yourself. And after that, there's one last stage. It's when you learn giving, receiving, and sharing. I can do the giving part. Receiving is hard. Receiving is easily one of the hardest emotions that I struggle with. I have to manifest that I will receive because I have to receive my receiving. I have to manifest it. It's that bad. Receiving is one of the hardest emotions for me. It's like every time anyone gives me, I just like, don't do that. And I know what that is. Every, that, that's level threes, giving you gifts and then saying, now you're my slave and I own you. And if you don't do exactly what you are told, obedient to the core, they remind you of all the debt you owe them. And that's still deep. And I'm every day trying to recondition that out of me. The receiving is the hardest part. Sharing is hard. Sharing the work, sharing money, sharing limelight, sharing space, sharing time is easily the hardest. I was a second child. 
uh, technically I was the middle child and then I was the middle child again. So oldest got the attention, baby got the attention and I was the one who was shelved. So sharing is something that, well, if I share my toys then there's not gonna be anything left for me. And that's just it. That is it right there. That is it. That's some brutal honesty that I now have to chew on. I love feeding myself honesty. I love the feeling I get when I'm honest with myself. It's this relief of, oh, I understand me a little bit better. Oh, that's my problem. I can now take care of my problem. It's a big problem. This is an old one. I always shared my siblings with my parents and I never got anything. My brother was always in criminal problems and my parents were always giving all their attention to him to bail him out. And my baby sister got to spend time with my father every night. The only memory, the only time I had with my father is every morning he and I would sit out at the porch in the middle of the forest and look at the sunrise. And I did that with him for one summer, and that was it. That was the only time I ever had with my father. So it's hard to share. It's hard to receive. Those are going to be the two hardest emotions for me to overcome because I can feel the resistance when I push them away as soon as I even say them. I can feel my body going, no, because I'm pushing them away. I can feel. So I'm going to be reconditioning that and manifesting that tonight. My record is two hours. I love, I love doing this. This is where I'm like, I time it. And then I go over to exploratory dialogues and I put it in abstract form and I document it is this time. This is how much marijuana I've taken. This much time has passed. And these are the side effects. Patient one is experiencing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then I'll go back in like 30 minutes later and document again. I love doing this. And my record to date is two hours of me being able to cognitive behavioral therapy the shit out of my brain. And then I can feel the tingling in the back of my neck from the nape of my neck all the way down my spine where all the nervous system is rewiring itself. Oh, I love that sensation. Yes, I love that sensation. <laughs> it's a great sensation. It's like, oh, there's the feel of my rewired nervous system. And I can feel my cognitive core shifting when that happens. And I can think clearly oh it's wonderful brain fog goes away i have had a lot and that's the more beautiful thing is the more brain fog mind you i created this under brain fog like i did most of my work with brain fog and trauma i was like leaning up against the door when my brother was screaming he's gonna fucking kill me while i'm documenting notes on psychology like i did this under pressure so now that the pressure is gone and now that the mental illnesses are out of the way and the brain fog is going away and my memory is coming back like, it's amazing because there's this massive no pressure on my eyes. It's like every day this eye pressure is just releasing. And I don't understand why. That's always been interesting to me. My eyes have been getting a lot of relaxation. Like suddenly they're not as tired anymore. Really, that's interesting. It was, I've had bad eyes since, since I was eight years old. And the pressure has gotten worse and worse and worse. And I noticed the more I started to heal, the more my cognitive core has been correcting itself. Um, and I'm sorry, that's frontal cortex. The more my prefrontal cortex has been correcting itself and I can feel it right there, the less my eyes have hurt to the point where, no, I still have pretty bad eyesight in the one eye, but headaches are gone. Migraines are gone. I'm, I'm stubbing chairs a lot less. My, it's extraordinary. Like the eye strain is, eye strain, that's it. The eye strain is completely gone now. And every now and then I'll get another sh perspective shift. I'll feel the rewiring in the back of my spinal system. And then my eyes will just release again. And I'm like, wow, that feels really nice. So I'm pretty sure there's like some sort of a neurological connection between trauma and eyesight. I'm certain of it. And I would love, I have a couple friends who are neuroscientists and they study the stuff. So I'll call them up and say, hey, can we have a chat? And that's really my secret. That is my secret. I didn't do textbooks. I read philosophy and formal argument and debate. And then I read physics. And then I read a little bit of psychology. And then I called up my friends who do this for a living. I've, I've, I had so many attorneys at one point. And I've got neuroscientists. I had a chemist. I had 
oh, like I, I have people. And I'll call up the people and I'll say, can I talk to you for a minute about your work? And I will pose something about, hey, I've got this philosophical thought and I've got this happening over here in psychology. Now you tell me what's happening in the brain. And we'll sit down, my favorite. It's when I was doing BDSM regularly and I was doing some psych work with BDSM. So I was seeing how the psychology was on BDSM and I was missing a piece. I wanted to know what was going on in the brain. So I called up my friend who is the neuroscientist. And I know that his particular field was studying the side effects or the effects of pain and pleasure on the brain. So I called him up and I said, all right, I have a question about your work. And he's like, what's up? I said, here's the deal. I said, I'm into BDSM. I'm studying psychology. Now I can give you psychology, ABC. This is what's going on. Psychology speaking, you tell me what's going on in the brain when this is happening. This is the scenario. You tell me what's happening in the brain. And he went, oh, there's a lot happening. I said, I know there's a lot happening. I'm going to tell you right now. I was married to a chemist for 12 years. I had access to these people. I read science fiction and Isaac Asimov. Don't dumb this down for me. I, I can follow you. Shoot. So he does. He gives me all of it. And I'm sitting here going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Gotcha. I understand what's going on. And then I threw the philosophy and the psychology back at him. And he was able to go, holy shit, that's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I just needed all the parts. Thanks. See you later. Now I'm going to go speak to a physicist. Like that's the kind of shit. That's the level. That's the level. Like when you have physicists and neuroscientists in your back pocket, when you have bioenergetics, that one's another one I love. And then you've got phenomenal astrologers, psychics. And like, I've got a team. I've got a team and I'm in the middle of it with my philosophy, my psychology and human behavior. And I'm going, okay, now if this is going on with the universe and I'm getting these kind of asthmic waves over here, seismic waves over here, and this is what I'm feeling, I'll contact my psychics over here and I'll be like, so tell me what's going on with the astrological world. They'll report in and then I contact my neuroscientist to see what brain chemistry is happening. And I'm sitting here in the middle with my philosophy going, I see everyone reports. And by the way, this is how I see a school being run. This is it. Why are classrooms isolated? We need the big picture. That's what level eight does. When you get into level eight, you get all the perspectives back. That's what it is. You can see all the perspectives and suddenly you can walk in and out of every perspective. If the matrix, if I had written the end of the matrix, if I had written the matrix to show you the difference, I'm gonna show you the difference. So if you have not seen the movie Matrix, watch the movie Matrix and then come back to this video because it's not going to make sense. And I, I'm going to have to just stick with it, assuming that you've seen it. So here's the scenario. He's told that he's in a Matrix, but he's never brought out of the Matrix. He stays in the Matrix the whole time, the whole movie. There is no, we're going to bring you into this outside world at level seven and show you what you're not right. No, in real life, you're in the Matrix. You have this guy walking up to you going, this is a Matrix. It's not real. And you've got to convince him that it's not real while he's inside of it. That's really what you're doing. And you have no idea because you're inside the matrix. And then they come along, they say, okay, now when you get out of the matrix at level six, you're going to cross over. And when that happens, now you can't cross over until you believe. You have to believe that you're standing in a matrix. You don't have, you're not going to have the luxury of seeing it before you believe it. But Neo did. So you're going to get to that point where you feel it. You feel this calling. You feel like something is off. And what it is, is you have tuned so deeply into the energy pool that you can feel how the matrix is misaligned. And that's when you get the calling and the pull to say, come out because it's hurting you. You, you align everything. You get to a six, six and you're still in pain and you can't figure out why you should be aligned. Your, your subconscious mind is a six and your identity is a six. Why don't you feel good? And you have this massive, the only thing left is the energy pool and the matrix pulling on you. So the only thing left when you hit six, six is this pull between the energy pool and the matrix. And you're going, something's pulling me. No, there's something over there. I can feel it. Something is, there's, and, and you're up against the door and you're looking, you know, there's a secret door and you are just like all over that door trying to figure out where that secret door is so you can open it up and get on the other side because you can feel it. And you think you're going insane. And you try talking to fives 
And most of them are really, some of them are starting to get, some of them, but they don't. You talk to fours and they just call you crazy. We don't even talk to threes, twos, or ones. No, no, no. We find twos and we talk to twos and we think, oh, you understand. And they go, yes. And they start talking about witchcraft. And you're going, no, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. You're thinking witchcraft and Wiccan. That's level two. Okay, you're not getting it. And now they can feel the ethereal thread just like a two, three can, a four can, a five can, but you get to six and this is different. This is different. Oh my God, does it feel different? And it's to the point where you have to go. You, you can't, you just have to go. I remember it was at the very end of my marriage. The marriage was already over. We were living together and I said, I have to go. And he's like, well, I don't understand. I'm like, you don't understand. I have to go. I have this thing in me, intuition, was just screaming, you got to go to New York. And it, it, you can't block it out. You go insane blocking it out. And then when you cross over, and I didn't cross over right away. When I crossed over, I was disoriented. I was confused. And then I saw, and I saw this one. It, it's, it's like looking out and you see this little blue speck. And you were once on that little blue speck. And it's just this massive, like you're looking at the entire system as if it were a carrier ship on the ocean. And you're suddenly in this little kayak in the sea. That's what it felt like. And then you remember all of those times that that guy was in the matrix trying to convince you that this was real. And wow, no, it was real. It's very real. And the weirdest feeling is, their rules don't follow you here. There are no rules outside of here. But you don't need them because my ethics are better than theirs. I am more ethically aware and have more ethical rules that are the core of my identity that define me. And I have to stay aligned at all costs to my ethics. So I have far stronger, healthier ethics than any system because the system just recurgitates. This is what you should do. But 90% of the people there don't agree, which is why there's so much violence. So when you get to level seven, your own humility keeps you in check. You would not make it this far without it. Your own gratitude your own patience, understanding, and gentleness keep you in check. Your own constant ability to self-evaluate and be self-aware keeps you in check. Your constant tuned into the intuition and identity and the energy pool keeps you in check. You, at level seven, answer only to the energy pool. And the energy pool says, you don't harm other people. And that becomes your code. You don't do anything to harm the energy pool. So yeah, it absolutely goes full circle. It absolutely comes back around again. And I feel like everybody with me right now is just growing with me. And very soon I'm going to find that right combination to my business. It's all going to click, 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 click. And I think that's it is it's time to upgrade again. It's like I get the TARDIS. It's like I'm in the TARDIS and I just regenerated again. And I'm on my eighth regeneration. And every time I regenerate, I get a new TARDIS. I'm really loving this analogy. So I'm going to be dropping a couple programs adding a couple programs that I'm now ready for, shifting it so that it reflects more of where I am now. That's the misalignment. That's why I struggled with work today is because I was out of alignment with it because I finally settled into eight. My subconscious mind is eight. My, my identity is eight and my business was not. My business was a six. 
I had five, no, yeah, I had pieces of five, I had pieces of six, I had pieces of seven, and I just went, ooh, we need to clean this up because this is not an eight. And now that I'm in the last, that section, seven, eight, nine, I have to tweak it up and up, up to my game. So I'm going to be uh, leveling up. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and cancel out the witch's, the witch's corner. I think I'm done with that phase. I'm, I've grown. I don't need it anymore. So, and it's definitely attracting the wrong kind of people. So I'm, I have my direction. I know what I'm doing. Thank you. And as always, there is subscribe to the channel because when you subscribe to the channel, you get everything all involved in it. And then I have available my website where you can shop my master classes there. That's on this healing garden.org. And I have goddess training coming up in August on the 14th. So thank you so much. And may the kindest of words always find you. What's up,